Good morning, living water. If you can, if you go ahead and stand up with us. If you're feeling discouraged this morning, just uh, let's give God everything that we have, problems. Let's go to him. He's a good, good father. Sing this with me. Why they think you're like an ever tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and I'm never, never alone. You're a good, good. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I. It's who I am, you're a good, good father. And I'm loved by you. You are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To It's who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. and you are perfect in all. for that. Satisfy, 
judge nor defender. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light.
blessed Savior, I we were singing that song I was reminded of Acts chapter 4 verse 12 where scripture says that there is no other name given by which man can be saved other than the name of Jesus what a sweet name what a precious name what a wonderful name it is are you grateful for the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ today let's go to him in prayer father we thank you today For the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you today for the salvation that comes through him. We thank you that it is through him and him alone that man can be saved. And God, we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ truly is Lord. And I'm grateful that we don't have to wait till that day comes, but we can declare it today. And God, I pray that we would declare it boldly that Jesus Christ truly is our Lord and our Savior. God, we know that in our world today, there's so many different things that can distract us from you. There's so many things that can pull us away, and there's so many people saying that there are other ways to get to you. But God, we know today that that is just not true, that we believe what your word says. That the only way to get to you as our Father is through your Son, Jesus Christ. And that is why we surrender our lives to him. God, we are so grateful for all that you do. And we're thankful today for your wonderful presence that's here with us. God, we thank you for this time of worship and to be able to come together and to celebrate all that you have done in our lives. All the many blessings that you continue to pour out. And God, we thank you that as we open up your word and study your word, that you will speak to our hearts. And God, we we look forward to what you have to say to us today through your word. God, I pray that our ears would be open. 
and our hearts would truly be ready to receive from you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, good morning. As Pastor David said, open your Bible or your copy of God's Word if it's on your electronic device to Acts chapter 16. We're in a series called Recalculating. And the big idea behind this series is life is a journey. And along this journey of life, from time to time, we'll get off course. We may take a detour. We may find ourselves nowhere near where we thought we might be. And it's important for us from time to time to pull over to the side of the road or to reevaluate our life's choices and where we're at. And so recalculating is the big idea of this, this series. Last week, we talked about recalculating our plans and God's will. And the, and the big idea of that whole message was this. We must embrace, understand, and accept the fact that God is in control of all things. And if we believe that God is in control of all things, it would be foolish of us as believers to go through life making our plans without including God in those plans. Amen? And so we talked about getting God from just the Sunday morning category. You know, we, we come to God's house, we worship him, and we acknowledge him on Sundays, but to include him on the Monday through Saturday um, events as well. So hopefully throughout the week, if you were here last week, you've been thinking about that and the, as you make those plans saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord willing, if I see you tomorrow, Lord willing, Deo Valente. How many of you have heard that word um, this week or used that word this week? Anybody? Great. It's awesome to know that no one's taking notes in church. That's really cool. <clears throat> I'm kidding. That's just a hard one to remember, but Dale Valente, God willing. Today, the title of the message is Recalculating Guidance and Obedience. It's kind of on the heels of what we talked about last week, but guidance and obedience. Um, so this morning, as I woke up, it was really cold outside, and you know, I started daydreaming a little bit, and I got up my maps on my phone, and you know, before we had the phone, we had the GPS, but it's cool that we got this phone in our hand, and you can open up the maps, and I pulled up Destin, Florida, because I'd sure like to be there right now, wouldn't you? I mean, I know there's a winter storm going through that area, but I just think of the beach and sunny when it's cold, I'm like, Destin, Florida. Let me ask you a question. I punched that in there, and I picked the route that's going to take me there. How many of you believe that'll get me to that destination? Raise your hand. It's kind of a trick question. Because, yes, it'll get me there, but it won't get me there until I do my part, right? So I have to put in the location and check the, the route that I want to take, and then I have to take the first step, get in the car, and start driving. And I have to follow the cues that my phone throws up to me from time to time if I want to get to that destination. Amen? And so we're following the direction of the GPS, and as it tells us, we listen to and we follow those instructions. And here's what I know. If we do our part following the instructions, we will get to the destination that we put into our phone. I mean, these things are pretty impressive, aren't they? I mean, mine calculates for traffic. It lets me know which one's the fastest route, the shortest distance, all that good stuff. But if something comes up, it'll make the detour for me. It'll let me know where I need to go. I'm confident in following this thing if I put the instructions in there that it'll get me where I want to go. Now, here's a couple things that you need to know about that. I may question sometimes the road that it takes me down, and I've done that. I mentioned that last week when I was talking about going up, uh, what was it, Phantom uh, Canyon Road in Colorado. I questioned, like, all right, Siri, or in that case it was Wilma, my old GPS, we broke up because Siri is much better. But Wilma was taking me on this road, and I questioned, do you really know where we're going? We ultimately got to our destination. The, the, the plans just changed along the way. So I may not completely understand. I may have some questions about the, the, the road that I'm on. And I may not even like the road that I'm on. One time, uh, one of my buddies and I were in Dallas, and we put in the destination and the GPS, and we were cruising, and it took us through probably the roughest part of Dallas. And I remember going, I, lock your doors. My gun is right here next to me. Um, and I was thinking, man, why are you doing taking us through the craziest part of Dallas? I was kind of a little bit scared, but we just kept following the prompts and following the prompts. And guess what? We got out of it, and we arrived at the destination that we were headed. Here, here's the point. God wants to guide us in our lives. And much like that GPS coordinates, God is our, I call it God's positioning system in our lives, and he wants to guide us. And here's what I know. His plans are great, and he's very capable of getting us to the ultimate destination. But if we want to experience God's best for our lives, we need to understand there's a two-part process, God's part and our part. Amen? Now, how foolish would it be for us to punch in our coordinates in a, in a GPS device and then be upset when we don't get there, but we've not done our part. Like, I'm mad that I'm not in Destin, Florida right now. I was hoping that when I punched that in, poof, it would just put me there. Wouldn't that be cool, by the way? Oh, I'd be awesome, like um, Tahiti. I don't know, just somewhere. 
pick a destination and end up there. But it'd be foolish of us to put that in there and just be mad when it doesn't take place. My phone says it's going to take me 15 hours and 44 minutes to get to Destin, Florida. The reality is God wants to guide our lives. And if we follow his lead, if we follow his guidance, his direction, he will lead us to where he wants us to go. Do you believe that statement this morning? All right, so we're going to look at today uh, the life of Paul, the apostle, his first two missionary journeys. He took two, uh, but we're going to focus primarily on the first one and the second one. And I want to pull out some observations about this guidance and obedience and these two that work together to get us ultimately to our destination. And so first, let's consider who we're talking about, Saul. Who was Saul? Saul was born of Tarsus. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He was very smart. He was a Pharisee. He was very zealous for the Jewish faith. In fact, he was so zealous for the Jewish faith that he got hacked off when he heard of this new way, and they called him the followers of the way, Christians, people that believed in Jesus. Jesus came, and he, he died. He was buried. He was raised again, and they're all going around talking about Jesus is the, the Messiah, the only way to the Father, and this made Saul mad because he was a very devout Jew. And so on his road to Damascus, he's going to get letters from the leaders there so that he can bring back with him Christians, these people who were out in this new religion in his mind's eye, and he was going to bring them back so that he could persecute them, and maybe even imprison them, or even kill them. And it's on that road to Damascus that he sees this bright light. It knocks him off of his donkey onto the ground, the scriptures tell us that he was blinded for three days. And then it says the Holy Spirit told this man named Ananias, hey, I want you to go down to Straight Street. Paul's going to be there. Excuse me, Saul's going to be there in this house. You're going to go lay hands on this man and tell him to receive his sight. And he's like, hold up, wait a minute. This is Saul. You know, Saul was just persecuting us. And everybody's kind of scared of him. And you want me to go where and do what? And he says, hey, listen, I've got a plan for Saul. And he's going to be my mouthpiece He's going to go take the message to the Gentiles, to kings, and to all the people of Israel. And I'm going to show him how much he's going to have to suffer on account of me. So God had a plan, a destination, if you will, in mind for this man named Saul. And Saul was immediately and radically changed. In fact, in Acts chapter 9, it says, And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. So that's pretty cool, right? He starts off persecuting the church. He has this encounter with Christ, and Christ has a, a plan for Saul. He has a destination in mind for Saul. I'm going to use this man and his passion and his zealousness, if you will, to go out and preach on my behalf now. And so he begins to work through Saul. So Saul um, joins up with the disciples. A funny story there. I'll get back to that in a moment. But in chapter 13, it records his first missionary journey. And I want you to notice in, first, in, in chapter 13, um, it says, While they were there praying and worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So again, God has a plan. Holy Spirit says, I want you to set these two guys apart. I've got a special job for them, and I've appointed them. I've called them to go. It says in verse 4 of chapter 13, So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit, and they went down to the seaport, um, and they got on a ship, and they sailed to the island of Cyprus. And so we find Saul just jumping right into what God's plan was for him. God was guiding him. The Holy Spirit had told him, I want you to go speak on my behalf to preach the good news of the gospel. And boy, did he. He got after it, didn't he? So this is who we're talking about, Saul, whose name would later be changed to Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote a lot of our New Testament books. Um, and so this observation that I want to look at this morning is this general guidance of God and more of a specific guidance of God. See, initially in chapter 13, when it talks about his first missionary journey, um, Paul and his companions went wherever they wanted to go. Because the, the main idea was to preach the gospel. How many know it's okay to preach the gospel anywhere? Right? And so in the first missionary journey, like, hey, this looks like an interesting route. Let's take this and let's go tell them about Jesus. That's okay. That's a general guidance of God. He was just guiding them. The main idea was to preach the gospel. And boy, they were preaching the gospel all over the island. They went north into the mainland and they began to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were obedient to the guidance of God. It was like a general guidance. Didn't matter where they went. I believe they could have just said, you know what, let's, 
Let's, let's stay here a day. Let's go over here the next day. Let's go over there the next day. The main idea was to go preach the gospel. And so there's this God's guidance, his general um, guidance. I think sometimes God generally just guides us. He's like, what do we know about God? He says he has a will for us. He wants us to grow in our faith. The word's called sanctification, right? And we talked in week one, what is the end goal for each one of us? More important than anything else is to love God and love people, Right? And I think generally speaking, following God's guidance for our lives, we can say, hey, he wants us to be saved. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he wants us to love other people as we love ourselves. If we do those, I think that we generally are following the guidance of God in our lives. Amen? And so we see that in Paul's first missionary journey. But in the second missionary journey, which is in chapter 16, we see something different that we didn't see in the first journey. And I like this because I think that many of us have probably experienced this or will experience it from time to time. And it's more of a specific direction, a specific guidance. And so as I said, it's the first time we see it. And it's in chapter 16, verse 6. Notice this. It says next, and this is after they, they, hang on a second, they went to the first missionary journey, they got back from there, and it says sometime later, they looked at each other and said, hey, let's go back and let's strengthen the churches that we, we visited with on the first journey. And so they're beginning this, this second missionary trip, and it says, verse 6, <clears throat> next, Paul and Silas traveled throughout the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them, say prevented them. So the Holy Spirit had prevented them from, what's it say, preaching the word. Now, the general guidance of God, he told them, go preach the word, right? And so now in chapter 16, we see a different picture here. that says, I want you to preach the word, just don't do it there. Now, it doesn't tell us why, and it doesn't say how the Holy Spirit prevented it. It just said that they were prevented from, or they were forbidden from, preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Notice that later... They would, and many churches would be formed in that area. But it's interesting as Paul was going on this missionary journey with his companions, that in this moment, we see kind of a, a, a negative response if you will, and when it comes to guidance. God says, okay, don't go over there. And so what do they do? Well, we better pack up our bags and go back home because God told us not to preach the word in Asia. No, it doesn't say that. It says, then coming to the borders of Mysia... They headed north for the province of Bithynia. What are they doing? What they did before. We're going to preach the word. We're going to go out and tell everybody about Jesus. And if he tells us not to go here, that's fine. We'll just change our course and we'll go to Bithynia instead. It says, so they were headed that way. And it says, but again, the spirit of Jesus, which is another word for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them or he did not permit it again. So two times in a row, these guys are going to do what they were told to do, is to preach the gospel, and they run into a, an obstacle. The Holy Spirit, for whatever reason, and we don't know, was it a dream? Was it somebody speaking with him? Was it circumstances? We don't know. We just know that they were prevented from doing that at the time. It says, so instead, they went on through Mycenae to the seaport of Traus. In verse 9, it says, that night, Paul had a vision, a man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave. Notice the word we there. It's the first time you see that. This is where we believe that Luke joins the party. And, and Luke is the one that wrote Acts. And he's basically talking about Paul and his, his companion going there. And then he says, now we decided to leave for Macedonia at once. They jumped on a ship, went across the sea, and they hit Europe. It says, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. So the big idea is they were to preach the good news, right? The first missionary journey, wherever you want to go, just go tell people about Jesus. And in chapter 16, all of a sudden, we see more of a specific guidance. I'll call it a closed door and an open door. Have any of you ever experienced a closed door? I mean, you had your heart set on something, and maybe you're taking steps toward that direction, and all of a sudden it just didn't work out. The job fell through, the home you were trying to buy didn't fall, you know, the financing didn't come through, or that person that you swore you were going to marry, it just blew up, and you're like, oh, that's not going to happen now. Has anybody experienced a closed door before? I think we all have from time to time, right? The question I have is when we experience the closed door, what do we do with that? As we see in the life of Paul and his companions, as they kept 
going. They kept being obedient to the guidance that God had given them. They just recognized it as God's guidance. Sometimes God's guidance is a closed door. And let me just say this. You heard Garth Brooks sing the song, Sometimes I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. I think that's really relevant right there, right? Sometimes God closes the door, and I think we need to say, God, thank you. Obviously, there was something on the other side of that door that I didn't understand or see that you're protecting me from making a huge mistake. I just love the fact that God loves us enough and cares for us enough that he'll close some doors in our path. Amen? So, these observations, sometimes it's just a general. We're just living this life, and then sometimes it's more specific. There were two negatives, and then there was the positive. It says they were at Trous, and they had a dream. Now, who was the man from Macedonia? I don't know. We don't, we don't know. But through this dream, they had discerned that God was saying, okay, I want you to go here instead. Now, some have said, well, maybe it's because God had already assigned Peter for this specific region, and Paul, Paul, this is your territory. Peter, this is your territory, and that's why. We don't know. And others, I think, it's kind of interesting because God's timing is always perfect. And maybe like a crop that's out in a field and it's not ready for harvest yet, maybe the Holy Spirit just said, hey, we're going to go there later, but they're not ready. But man, the, the harvest is ripe over here. And so, Paul, I want you to redivert, and I want you to go to Macedonia, and I want you to preach the gospel there. So he saw an open door. And what did he do? He jumped on a ship and he went. So this might be a good time to talk about obedience. What does obedience mean? Uh, obedience simply means following the commands or the guidance of. And we're talking about God's guidance. God guides us, and so it's our part to just follow his guidance in our lives. I think sometimes, and I struggle with this too, we're not always great on that part, right? And we get frustrated when things don't work out the way they should. And let me just remind you that God is a faithful guide. His plans are, are great for us. Um, he knows all things. He's omniscient. We talked about that last week. And he loves us. He says he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. God is a faithful God, worthy of following. Amen? Amen. But then there's our part. And our part is to, to put one step in front of the other to say, God, I want to follow you. We sing the song, I surrender all. It's like, God, it's not about me. It's about you. And if this is where you want me to go, I want to be obedient to that call. And I want to just take off in that direction in obedience to you. And from time to time, he will specifically close doors and open doors. Here, here's one for you. You're driving down the road, and God puts somebody on your heart. You're not thinking about them. You're just thinking about a billion other things. And all of a sudden, somebody's name comes to the front of your mind. And you're like, I feel like I need to call them. You ever done that? Happens to me a lot. Um, hey, God just put you on my mind, and I thought I would call out and just see how you're doing, let you know I love you, and uh, thinking about you today. I think that's God. I think that's God just guiding us and open doors. Here's another one for those of us that struggle with forgiveness. Probably, probably not in this room, right? What's this? And this has happened, okay? You're offended at someone, and, and it doesn't go your way, and you're mad, and you're just like, oh, I can't stand this person, and God's working on your heart, and he's saying, hey, you need to forgive that person. And you're like, I know, you say I'm supposed to forgive them, but right now I don't want to see them. And everywhere you go, you cross their path. I hate it when that happens, right? But that's just how God works, isn't it? It's like we're avoiding it at all costs, and it's like, there they are again. It's like, okay, God, I get it. I see it. But the thing I want us to get is there's are two parts to this thing about experiencing God's best for our life. God guides. He's faithful in his part, but then there's our part, and we're not always faithful, are we? And we get frustrated when we don't end up seeing what we'd hoped that we'd see in our lives. And I just want to remind us that there's this thing of guidance and obedience, and they work together to get us to our ultimate destination. And God uses circumstances, situations, that, that, that detour that you had to take literally on the highway, maybe God saw a major wreck ahead of you and he says, I need to close that door because I've got a plan for them and it, and it doesn't include them coming to see me just yet, so I'm going to divert them for a while and we're over there throwing a fit and dropping about our day being inconvenienced, right? But God's a good guide and he guides us and he generally guides us and he specifically guides us as we see in their life this open and closed doors so that's God's part, and God's faithful. Amen? Amen? But then there's our part. And as I said, we're not always faithful. So look at what Paul and Silas did. They didn't turn around and go home. Well, we were preaching the gospel. That's what we were told to do. And he just said not to do it. So and we're to take from that that maybe our job is done. Let's just turn around and go home. Oh, in fact, I threw a map up here. Go to the first one. The first journey, um, it's the smaller circle if you're following on the computer back there. Guys, sorry. I they hate it when I do that to them. So notice the trip that they took, the first missionary journey. That's a pretty significant journey, isn't it? I mean, on a ship or by foot. In a car, no big deal. 
But that was a pretty significant one. That was our first missionary journey. Go to the second one. Okay, so my ADD kicked in, and I had to get on my map, on my computer, and do some math. And I figured over 2,300 miles that these guys left from Antioch and made this long missionary journey telling people about Jesus. Now, what would happen if he had got to that spot there where the Holy Spirit hindered him or prevented him from going on, if he just said, well, we're to conclude that our time is up and we're done with our journey, so let's just go home. Look at all the places beyond where you see Cilicia is at or whatever it is, all those places beyond that that never would have been reached for Christ. I'm thankful for Paul's obedience, right? I'm thankful that he didn't get deterred a little bit from the main mission, but he says, hey, God's got a general plan, and it's for me to preach the gospel. And if you don't want me to go there, guess what? I'm going to go here. Oh, you don't want me to go there too? I'm okay with that, God. I'll go here and just keep going. It's in the going that we get the guidance from God. Now, I know people, and I was one of them, that sometimes we want to have all of our ducks in a row, have it all figured out before we take that first step of guidance or of obedience. Anybody else struggle with that? So, so watch this. The very first time I was asked to preach, years ago, pastor said, hey, you're going to preach. And I'm like, D -d 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 I'm a cable guy, right? You're going to preach. And I was terrified. And so I wrote it all out. I had this sermon and, and, pr and practice, if you will. Going through it in my mind, is like, I've got 30 minutes worth of material right here. This ought to work out really well. And I step in the pulpit, and I was done with that sermon in five minutes. You think I talk fast now. I don't know what it was like. It was a blur. I was the original Flash. I was done. But I remember thinking whenever I was asked to do that, I was like, I'm not qualified to preach. I don't have it all figured out. I don't know the first thing about where to start. I mean, I didn't go to seminary. I don't know what to do. But God called me. And God gave the opportunity. He opened the door. And he's looking for me just to take a step of obedience. And God rewards the obedience. And he does it in your life as well, right? So I've had people before like, man, I know I've got a neighbor and the neighbor needs to hear about Christ, but I just don't know where to start. And so generally they'll call a pastor. Pastor, can you come talk to my neighbor? And he's like, hey, we're all in this thing together, and we're all his witnesses, right? And if we wait till all the details are laid out before us, we'll probably never take a step of obedience. And so here's an observation about obedience that we need to know. Our obedience does not require that we know all the details first. Our obedience to God does not require that we know all of the details first. God, if you'll just show me, I think it would freak us out if God showed us the big plan. I think we would be scared to take the first step, right? It's more like, let me just give you navigation, turn by turn, day by day, direction. Because if I show you the big picture, you're not going to want to go to some of the places that I want to take you through. So our obedience to God does not require us having all the answers First, Paul didn't have the answers of why he wasn't to go to Asia and to Bithynia, but he kept obeying, he kept following. And so just remember that. Our obedience does not require that we know all the details first. A second observation about obedience is, and this one's kind of a, a hard one for us sometimes, our obedience does not guarantee favorable outcome. So I said I would say this. I'll go back to it now. So go back to the conversion of Saul. Saul was converted God says, you're going to be a messenger, first rattle out of the box. Some of the Jewish people are refuting him as he's saying Jesus is indeed the Messiah, and they try to kill him. Chapter 9, right at the very beginning. You're not starting off really well, right? If you, you're like, God's got a plan for my life, and he wants me to do that. Oh, they want to kill me? Oh, I must have made a mistake, right? No, that was what he went through. And so they, they lower him from the city wall, like, we got to get him out of here in a basket through, at night, in a hole in the wall. They lower him out, and they send him to Jerusalem. The only problem at Jerusalem was everybody was scared of him because he used to persecute the church. So he shows up with the brothers, and he's like, hey, guys. And they're like, mm -hmm, no, don't let him in. He was persecuting the church, and it took Barnabas to encourage them and say, hey, God has gotten a hold of his heart, and he's a new man, and he's one of us now. And so he stays in Jerusalem. He begins to preach in the synagogues doing what he's called to do. And it says there, in chapter 9 again, just getting started, there's some Jewish people there sought to kill him. And so they finally sent him to his hometown of Tarsus and said, hey, just camp out there for a while. And later it says Barnabas went to look for Saul and found him in his hometown. And that's when they began that second journey. On the second journey, well, let me go back to the first journey, because the first journey, they went to this little this island, Cyprus, and they went north um, into the mainland, and there's a little town called Lystra and Derby. 
And it says in Lystra that he's preaching there and some people got mad at him and took him outside of town and they threw rocks at him and they stoned him and left him for dead. Preaching the good news, right? Left for dead. His friends come by, they grab him, um, they take him into Derby and later in Derby he says, hey, let's go back to, to Lystra and the rest. Let's backtrack. Uh-uh. We, you were stoned and left for dead in that town. And he's like, we're going to go back. And they went back and then just look at his journey and think about it. There were were no favorable results. Not all of them were. There were many other that were favorable results, and that's what we look at. Because the way I'm wired, I I want to know that my efforts are going to have favorable results. If if I don't think it's going to work out great, I don't want to do it. And I think therein lies the problem with most of us is God says, hey, I've got a plan for you. I want to guide you, and I may guide you through some things for a purpose. I want to grow you in your faith. I want to mature. You're going to have to experience a little hardship along the way because I've got a, a master plan. For you, and we're like, Mm-mm. if I can't get favorable results, then I'm not going to do it. And so we need to know this: that our obedience does not guarantee favorable outcomes. Most of us trip, um, as I said, most of us trip up here. For Paul, there were plenty of negatives, but there were a lot of positives. Do you know that in the second missionary journey, when he was rediverted to go to Mesopotamia, that's Europe, that the first Convert to Christianity was a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, in a place called Philippi. And she would start a church in her house. And God would do some amazing things from there forward. And just the gospel just kept spreading. And I'm like, thankful that Paul just kept following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, aren't you? And so there was a lot of outcome that was awesome. There was some that was not so awesome But the reality is we have to trust the guide knowing that his plan is a perfect plan. And even though we don't understand it completely, man, we just got to trust him, right? Trust the guide. And one last thing about this obedience, and this is kind of a hard one for us, but um, how many of you know that our obedience equals or demonstrates our love for God? That sounds kind of harsh, right? Well, when I'm not obedient, that means I don't love God. Well, consider Jonah. Let me ask you a question. The first week we talked about the end goal was love God and love people. And so God goes to Jonah and he says, I want you to go to Nineveh, specific place, right? Specific guidance. Go to Nineveh. There's a group of people there and I want you to preach repentance to them or judgment. And they're going to repent. And Jonah's like, I hate those people, right? So he failed in the loving people department. And he says, nope, I don't want to do that. And so what does he do? He jumps on a ship and he sails in the opposite direction where God told him to go. And this is where it gets cool because this is the first instance of this. I think God from heaven goes, recalculating, right? Like I told you to go here and you went the opposite direction. So watch this. He gets thrown into the water and he gets swallowed by a big whale. The whale spits him back out on the lake. It says, do I have your attention now? I mean, I don't know. It'd be cool if he said that. Recalculating. Well, how cool would it be in our life if we're journeying along and we take a wrong detour? If we heard in that loud voice, deep recalculating. After we peed a little, we'd be like, okay, okay. But he guides us, amen? He guides us. And, and so Jesus said, if you, if you love me, you'll do what I say. If you love me, you'll obey me. And so I would say our obedience equals Loving God. And so we see in Jonah's life, he, didn't, he wasn't demonstrating that he was loving God at that moment because he was disobeying God's direct um, guidance to go to Nineveh. And he certainly wasn't loving other people. We're called to love God and love people, right? And so in contrast to that, we have Paul who loves God and he is on a mission, isn't he? And he loves people. And so for that reason, he would follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit wherever he led him to go. I love that. Following God's guidance requires that we trust him. And we say that, we trust, to rely on him, to know that he's capable. It means that we trust him. We trust that he loves us. Do you know that he loves you this morning? He he loves us. We trust that he has a plan for us. And Jeremiah says, I know the plans that I have for you. I mentioned this last week. It stands to reason that he knows the plans that he has for each one of us in here today. And so if we trust him, we trust that he loves us, and we trust that he has a, a master plan for us then our response is to daily just get up and say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Lord, what step do you want me to take today? Would you guide me? And I trust the Holy Spirit to guide us each step of the way. In the workplace, I know you're mad about something at the workplace, and here's what you want to do. Holy Spirit says, that's a closed door for now. Don't respond with that. Instead, respond with this. 
And the choice is yours to obey his guidance or to disobey his guidance. To disobey his guidance is equal to rebellion. And he says rebellion is like witchcraft. It's a huge sin. So how many know this is a real important thing, this God's guidance and our obedience? Amen? And so the Apostle Paul models that for us. What does this obedience look like? I think he laid it out beautiful for us. And he's like, if there's a closed door, I don't just quit. First off, he was going when he was getting the specific guidance, but he didn't quit, but he just redirected and he kept on mission, kept on following God's general guidance. Paul later writes to a church in Thessalonica, which I have to go back and think about this for a moment. Yes, this is his response to the vision he had of Macedonia because Thessalonica would have a church later because of his obedience. He writes to the church at Thessalonica in verse 7, he says, in 2 Thessalonians, he says, And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever, separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Did you catch that? He says that we're to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does that look like? What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, I'd say it's, again, two parts. God's part, our part. What is God's part? For God so loved the world that he gave, right? That's God's part. He loved us so much that he gave. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's God's part. And he says, our part is, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him, to believe on him. Pistevo is the word. It means to rely on and to trust him. He says, whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. See, God wants to guide each one of us. And he says he's willing that none should perish but all. Say all. All would come to repentance. And so here's the good news. Good news is God loves us. No matter where you've been, what you've done. God loves you, and God is not willing that any would perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants us all to come to repentance. And so we all stand at a crossroad at some point in our life where we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we either refuse to obey it or we obey it. And you've heard me say a million times the most important decision we'll make in this life is placing our faith in the gospel. That is to obey the gospel. Amen? If you're here today and you're not taking that step, can I just tell you it is so important that you obey the gospel by believing in what Jesus did for you on the cross. Trust him with your life. For Christians today, I want you to know that your life matters. I mean, every detail of our life matters. We're going through this thing called life as a journey. And in this journey, he wants to guide us. And he's a faithful guide. He truly is a faithful guide. And we should be able to trust him in his guidance, even when we don't completely understand it. Even when we can't figure it all out. Just say, God, I can't see... Right now, and it looks a little scary. I was talking with someone the other day about how God guides us, and it's like, I think sometimes we look up and we see all the scary around us, and it's in those moments that I feel like the Holy Spirit says, hey, don't, don't look at that. Look at me. Look at me. Just one step. Just keep following me. Follow me. I'm going to lead you through this, right? Just keep your eyes on me. Follow me. Follow my guidance, and I will lead you safely through. How many know that's a good, good guide worthy of following? The question is, are we obedient to his guidance in our lives? I think so many of us miss out on God's best because like, God, I trust you and I love you, but I just don't want to do that. And he says, if you do love me, you'll do what I say. He is an ultimate God, and we should trust him with our obedience. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for having a plan. Lord, we don't always have everything figured out, but I know that you've got a master plan. And we may not see all the details. We may even get frustrated from time to time when we feel like we're going on a path uh, that seems scary or hard for us. And we wonder, God, what are you doing? We trust you. And it feels like you're totally hanging us out to dry. But God, we know that your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. We know that you're an awesome guide and you will safely get us to wherever it is you want us to be. Lord, but help us today to just cement that in our minds that it's a two-part process. You've done your part. You're doing your part. Your Holy Spirit lives within us and guides us daily. We have to do our part. 
at heeding the voice, heeding the direction and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and, and just being simply obedient to your guidance. Well, we confess that, Lord, many times we're disobedient to your guidance. We hold on to things that you say are really unhealthy for us, sin, whether it's just outright sin or whether it's a sin of unforgiveness, and we hang on to it because we think we know better. Lord, you're the ultimate guide. Lord, I pray that today we could just be obedient to your word, just obedient to you in the specifics and the nonspecifics, the general direction that you have for our lives. And Father, that one day we get down the road and we're able to look back and see how you carried us safely through our destination. Lord, just uh, thinking about that GPS and how crazy it is for us to ask you to guide us and then just expect that we're going to be there like we would say, send me to Destin, Florida. Lord, we realize that there's a big part um, that we play in that, and it's our obedience. So God, forgive us of our disobedience. Help us to be obedient to you today. For some of those that need to place their faith in you, they've heard the gospel, the gospel that you love them and you sent Jesus to make them right with you, and their step is to trust you, to trust you with their faith and with their life. God, I pray that today would be the day that they would step into obedience and trust you for salvation. Lord, I humbly ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.